Let's talk about actions first. So what we want to happen is that when this movie gets launched, in other words, when we do a command return or someone opens up our Swift file, we want it to immediately stop. So the first rule of writing actions is that actions always go on the very top layer and that layer is always named actions. That makes it very easy if you're working with a team also makes it easy if you need someone to troubleshoot your code you never want to write actions anywhere but on this line and actions work a lot like keyframes and that uh, in fact they are keyframes uh, so if you want actions to appear on the first frame you need to create a blank keyframe which we know we automatically get that but if I want actions to appear over here on frame 50 I would need to click here and do uh, an F7 so that I would get a blank keyframe on frame 50. So let's first do an action in the very first frame. I don't expect anyone to become an expert in writing Action Script 3.0 in this class, so I'll point out most of the stuff, or all of the stuff that you need to get by in this class, but I'll also try to point out some things that could get you started writing it your own. So there's two things you should know about here. When we go up to Window, if you already know what the action is and you want to go ahead and put it in, you would go window and then actions to open up the actions panel. If you're trying to figure something out on your own and you have no idea where to go, you can try this, code snippets. So it's kind of like some little shortcuts built in in this little menu here and you just click on what you're using and we're using action script 3.0. So if we fly this open and then some of these, you know, it just takes experience to know where to go searching. But um, we're in particular looking for timeline navigation because we want the, the timeline to stop. So let's start there. And then oh, that kind of looks like what we're going for. So th again, this is just all hints. But if I click on this or double click on it, it actually opens up the actions panel for me, the first thing I mentioned. And it writes some code in here. Now I'm going to click away from it so you can see some color coding in effect here. Anything that's between this forward slash and an asterisk and then an asterisk and a forward slash means that it's just, it's nothing. It's, it's what's known as being commented out. So they're telling you this will make it stop at this frame and then it gives you a little bit more of a description of what's happening. But this is the actual code that it's writing. So this is saying, I think this is what you want. And it opened it up, put it in the actions panel. And you can see it says actions one here, which means that is the first frame of the actions panel. You can also see that down here, there is a little A that shows here, letting us know that in frame one, we have written some code. So let's see if this works. So I'm going to go ahead and just close the actions panel just for a second and close the code snippet. And I'm going to hit command return. And everything looks great, right? Because it launched the video and it is stopped. So now if I go up to the controls up here and I select play, it pl starts to play the video. So we must have done it right. And we did. Um, if there were problems, typically what would happen is another window would open up here instead of your timeline and it would give you some possible errors that, that maybe you made. And another common use for the stop action is to go ahead and make your video stop on the last frame. Even though we haven't completed ours yet, but let's go ahead and do that. So what we would do is move all the way over to the very last frame go into the layer for our actions, click on the very last frame, and then do an F7. So we now have a frame to write some actions in here. And since we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here, let's just go and grab what we have in the code here. So what I'm going to do is click on the first frame. Once again, go to Windows in Actions to open up the Actions panel. And since I know this is what I need, I'll just Command-C to copy that. I will then 
Next, I'm just going to close that for a second here, and then I'm going to wheel on down to my last frame there. Make sure that that is what I'm clicked on, and then we'll go ahead open up actions again. And now you can see it says actions, and it gives us that frame number. So Command V, paste that in. Go ahead and close actions, and now you can see I have that little A there. So that's telling me that I have written some actions on frame 370 whatever and also on the very first frame. And if I preview this, it opens up, stops in the first frame, and then we go to uh, control, which actually, you know, we're just doing control for right now. Eventually, we want to have some buttons in here that, that make the video play from wherever we want it to play. Um, but if we go to control and we play it, it should start to play, and when it gets to the very end, it should stop. And let me tell you something that would be very smart on your part is whenever you write actions, and I would write this down somewhere prominent so you look at it as you're working on your animations. When you write actions, only do one at a time. So it would not be wise for you to put the start in the first frame and the start in the last frame and then test it. The reason is if one is bad, they all act bad. So if you got the first one right, but the last one was wrong, in fact, let me just show you what that would look like. So I went in here and I purposely goofed the code up a little bit. I'm going to do command return and look what's happening. It, it didn't stop at the first frame, so you would think, well, obviously, I have my mistake is, is in the first frame. But no, that's not how it works. If one's bad, they kind of all seem bad. And this is what happens is next to the timeline, you get this compile errors it opens up, and it does its best to tell you where the problem is. And probably the nicest thing about it is at least it's telling us that it's frame 371 that the problem is in. And then it says call to possibly undefined method, stop it. Well, that might not be very helpful, but I mean, this might be if, if you know what I did. So if we go back in here and uh, go to, in fact, let me just show you another way. If I um, go to here and I right click, I can select to open up actions all the way at the bottom here. That might be a quicker way to get in there. And so what I did was I just goofed around and, and said stop it instead of stop. Another thing you'll notice is that there's a lot of color coding that happens in the actions. Typically things that is computer talk is in blue. And then things that you make up, which you'll see later, will not be color coded. And that can actually help you know whether you're on the right track or not. OK, so let's make some buttons now. So I'm going to go to this very first frame. And then right above actions, I'll make a new layer, call it buttons. And let's go ahead and start to create some buttons with the text from the grade sheet. So this text I just created, Helvetica Canoe, regular 25 point black, will become my button. So anything can really become a button in the same way that anything or most things can become a symbol. So, in fact, it is a symbol. A button is a symbol. So what I'm going to do is click on this, and just like you've done before, I'm going to cl click on F8, and this time I'm going to change the type. Instead of being graphic, I'm going to change it to button. Then I'll give it a name, and uh, maybe I'll just call it Guide, since that's the overall name of the topic we're going for, Animation Along a Path. Uh, which is a guide, click OK. Now, if we go to the library, we can see that there in alphabetical order is the new thing that we just made. The icon next to it lets us know that it is a button. And then we can click here to edit this button. So if we made a mistake in the text, we can edit it. But also, we want to go one step further with a button always anyway. So we double click here. It opens the button up in the edit mode, just like when we did a symbol. It has its own timeline, just like a symbol, but it's kind of a specialized timeline. It has four states here. We have an up state, an over state, a down state, and a hit state. So the up state is just what does that button look like normally? The over state is what does it look like when someone hovers the mouse over it? And that's where you want to give a little more indication to the user that this is indeed a button, so it should change color, 
or something like that when the user rolls over it. And we'll go back into these in just one second, but I want you to see something even before we do that. If I do a command return, you can see that one thing that it does automatically when it becomes a button, watch my cursor right now, it's just the arrow, just the arrow. But when I go over here, it changes to a finger. And you can see that it's not perfect the way that it works right now, right? I actually have to be on top of a letter for it to, to, to give me the finger. Um, and we'll fix that as well when we talk about these states. So the first one we'll take care of is we want it to look different when the person puts the mouse over. When the mouse is down, that means clicked. To me, they've already committed. So here's my shortcut for creating buttons. I just want to start on the first frame and then I'm going to go F6, F6. And so what that does is copies the same contents and all three, but more importantly, it makes up and down the same. And then I want to go to over and I want to change that. So I'm going to put my text cursor in here so that I can get my text options for this chunk of text. Just a click and a drag here, go over to properties, and I'm going to change the color. And you want to be a designer when you do this kind of stuff, not make any super crazy uh, things. I'm just going with a lighter color gray. And I might just do one other thing here and change it from regular to italic. And then now if we preview this, what we'll see is that when we go over the top of it, it changes color a little bit and it switches to italic. I don't really like the fact that I have to be so picky about where I am before it actually becomes a button. And that is what the hit state is for. So if we go back in here to the button, go to the hit state, I'm going to give myself an F7 so that I now have a blank frame in here to work with. And I just popped open on me, so let me... Okay, so I just want to make that hit area bigger, clearer. The problem is, is if I'm over here, I can see what I have. If I'm over here, I can't, but we remember that problem from frame by frame, and the solution is to turn on onion skinning down here. And when I click on onion skinning, I get the parentheses, and I just need to be able to see back one frame. And then now all I'm going to do is take the rectangle tool, and it really doesn't matter what color I use. And to demonstrate that, I'll use a you know pretty bold different color here, a bright green. And I'm just going to make a box over the top of this that is the area that I want to be clickable. And that's it. And then now, if we go and preview this in a browser, we can see that we don't see the green. But as soon as we get to where the green is, it is now a button. And we get that little hint of interactivity that goes along with it. Okay, so now that we're happy with that button, I'm going to turn off the onion skinning and then I'm going to click here a couple times to get back to just main scene. Actually, just one click was all it took. And then now we want to, now that this is a button, we want to program the button. You program the button or write the action for the button in the same frame that the button appears. So the button appears in frame one, so that means that we need to go back into the action script for frame one to write it. Now there's a very important concept about buttons, and that is you have to know what button you're trying to write. And let me drive this point home. If I go to the library and I see this button that I created, I can drag out, what are these called? The one in the library is the symbol, and in this case, the symbol in the library happens to be a button, but all these are instances. So I have to know, or my code has to know, what instance it's talking to. And even if we only have one instance of that button out on the stage, doesn't matter. We have to identify it. So what we do is we go into Properties, and watch this, if I click on nothingness, you know, shows us stuff about the document. When I click on this symbol, which is a button, it tells me right here, it is a button. And then it looks like a default here. It just says instance name. So I need to give this an instance. It has nothing to do, the, the name of this instance has nothing to do with the name that it's named in the library. They could be the same thing, and in fact, in a lot of cases, it makes sense just to limit the amount of different names we have floating around to name it the right thing. So I'm going to name it 
guide. But I'm going to go one step further and do an underscore and btn. And that's the way I like to name buttons. And when you're using code hinting, sometimes this helps you out even more, putting that underscore btn on there. And in the next video, we will make that button work.